So, Todd, maybe we could just start off with you. Um, you know, the title of the, uh, the presentation is The Criminalization of HIV AIDS. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about, you know, what that means for you. Sure. Um, actually, let me back it one step. Sure. I actually stole the, the title from a, a piece that I wrote for the Woodhull Sexual Freedom Alliance, and I'm going to call it Viral Apartheid. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a, a stunning word, but I really do believe that we've created a, a group of haves and have-nots when we talk about zero status in the United States, well, in Canada as well. So when we talk about that, we're talking about people being subjected to criminal sanctions solely on the basis of their HIV positive status. Um, you know, you can have sex with somebody and not disclose that you have herpes. That's not a crime. But as an HIV positive person, if I don't disclose, I've committed a felony and go to prison for four years in Michigan. Hmm. Um, we see these laws being used all over the United States to criminalize people who are already on the outer rims of society. Um, African American women who are poor, uh, generally teenagers, we're seeing it uh, going after white gay men as a way to, to silence them. Um, and we see it being used against straight black men. As you know, many uh, African American men are finding out that they're HIV positive while incarcerated, and so many black men are incarcerated in America today. Um, and what happens is they're forced to sign this document saying, I understand the, the, the laws here. And then three years later, suddenly that document appears and it's used to convict them of failing to disclose. The problem with that is they're never told, oh, by the way, you're waiving your Fifth Amendment rights to self-incrimination here. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some real issues there. Uh, so that's HIV-specific criminalization. But we're also starting to see the rise of HIV non-specific criminalization. For instance, the case of Daniel Allen in Macomb County, who in 2009 was being gay bashed, and I'm sorry, it was 2010, and he was attacked by three men, and he bit one of them through the lip. The news found out that he was HIV positive and started reporting that, and the Macomb County prosecutor, on uh, his uh, hearing, uh, preliminary hearing, added a bioterrorism charge against him mm. um, based on an obscure appeals court ruling that said HIV-infected saliva is a biohazardous material. And it took him 10 months to shake that charge. Mm. The problem is, is that, you know, I spoke to him just a couple of weeks ago, it's destroyed his life. He got, he, the charge got dismissed, but it's destroyed his life. Everybody calls him the bioterrorist. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about when we talk about criminalization, is it's the ultimate form of stigmatizing people who are living with a virus. It's a scarlet A when you get right down to it. And it can, it, we're finding it being used as a, um, a weapon in domestic violence cases. We're finding it being used in a, as a weapon when people break up and they want to hurt each other. It's just become a really dangerous weapon that a lot of people are being destroyed with. In terms of the how this has been, the criminalization of HIV AIDS, how it's been sort of, as part of the law, in other words, who is behind or what factors have sort of determined that this is how they're interpreting the law with this this kind of issue in particular? Is there, is this, is this kind of a, is, this a, is, it a, is there a political movement to do it? Or is it just because of sort of internalized, um, you know, hatred or, or bias against people with HIV AIDS? I mean, what? A combination of both, actually. Right. Um, the first documentation that I can find of a recommendation for an HIV-specific criminal law was in the 1988 Reagan Commission report on the HIV epidemic, which is also called the Watkins Report. And in that, they make a recommendation that all states have ways to criminalize people for not disclosing their HIV status. Um, that coincides directly with Michigan statute, um, and they talk about it specifically in terms of scientific evidence. The problem is, is that that little caveat was not put into any of those laws that have passed. So, for instance, in Missouri, biting in and of itself is a felony crime if you're HIV positive. Mm. It's considered reckless endangerment. Mm. Um, in Florida, there was just a court ruling, ironically, that only heterosexuals can be charged under the statute because the definition of sexual intercourse can only be found in one statute, and it's defined in the um, incest law, which only defines incest as between a, a adult male and, and a female. So that's a there's these really weird things that are happening. 
Mm. But the Reagan administration really pushed this thing forward. And then Bush Sr., um, when he signed into law the Ryan, Ca or Ryan White Care Act in 1990, it had a part in it that said every state has to certify that it has a way to criminalize people who don't disclose their HIV status. I mean, that's sort of just what you're listening to what you're saying. It, to some degree, it kind of, I guess unless people who, who kind of are uh, thinking about and organizing around HIV AIDS issues, it sort of flies in the face with sort of the, the general attitude that you get that somehow now in 2011, you know, HIV AIDS is much more manageable, you know, the drugs, all these kinds of things that it, it, that it doesn't kind of come with the same level of like, you know, fear or or urgency that it maybe oh. maybe it used to. That's sort of the, just sort of the, I guess the perception I, I get from people are like, oh, AIDS. I mean, yeah, you know, it's it's a problem, but it's not like what it used to be. The stigma for those of us living with the virus is overwhelming. Um, I mean, I've had people tell me that I should be shot for being gay, HIV positive, and being out about it and talking to people online. Mm -hmm. So if that's how people respond online, how are people responding in real life? I've had people who I've gone out on dates with who, after they find out I'm HIV positive, say, you know, you're a really great guy, but I can't date you because I might get HIV from you. Hmm. The, the level of ignorance is astounding. In fact, the CDC found that uh, our understanding of HIV transmission as a country is at the level of 1987. Hmm. So we haven't learned anything you know, in, in 20 some years. Uh, so that stigma is there. And actually what's amazing is that about 75% of gay men support criminalizing HIV uh, hmm. non-disclosure hmm. um, until they're infected and then suddenly it shifts. And the group that is the most strongly supportive are 18 to 20 year olds who are the least likely to be tested for HIV and are using the idea of zero sorting. Mm. The problem is, is that you know one in five gay and bisexual men is HIV positive. 44% mm. of those men who are HIV positive don't know it. So Jim can say to Joe, hey, I'm HIV negative and actually be infected. And because he's not under medical care, his viral load is probably higher, his immune system is probably weakened, he's more likely to transmit the virus. Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, yourself as an independent journalist, I mean, what, what's your sense of how, particularly how the commercial media, but uh, has sort of what role they've played in kind of continuing to foster this lack of understanding, oh, this misperception? It. They feed it. In fact, a uh, Kaiser Family Foundation report, uh, AIDS at 30, that came out in June, found that, uh, I, I'm trying to remember this number off the top of my head, so I apologize, I may get it wrong, but I think it's 78% of Americans get their information about HIV AIDS from the news media. Well, if that's where people are getting their information from, then no wonder they think you can get HIV from biting. Um, uh, significant numbers of people don't want their kids being taught by an HIV positive teacher. They would feel uncomfortable eating food prepared by an HIV positive person. Uh, like 25% still believe that you can get HIV by sharing a glass with somebody who's HIV positive. Mm. Those kind of, of understandings of American public opinion is really important for us. The fact is, is that the stigma for HIV remains incredibly high. It is still a frightful idea for most people because it conjures up sex, drugs, religion, and oh yeah, death. Those are four things that Americans don't talk about except when they talk about sex, drugs, religion, and death. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we like to pretend like we don't talk about those things, but right. we do. And that's the problem here is that we're not talking about them in ways where we're informing each other. Well, maybe one last question. Um, so what are, what's your understanding of what people are doing, you know, on the, on the ground activists to kind of respond to this ongoing criminalization of HIV AIDS, whether it's maybe starting specifically with Michigan, and then if you know of any other kind of best practices around the country, around the world for that matter. Sure. The Michigan Positive Action Coalition has been a phenomenal resource for me. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm one of the few voices in the country who's digging up the policies and the procedures mm -hmm. that are leading to these criminalizations. Um, the Center for HIV Law and Policy uh, launched in September of 2010 the Positive Justice Project. Mm -hmm. 
as a result of their advocacy as well as NAPWA, which is the National Association of People with AIDS, and the uh, uh, Women with, with uh, HIV Network, um, and several other national groups, they have been able to get uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee to introduce the Repeal HIV Discrimination Act, which would force the, the states to repeal those acts. Um, and by withholding the money the same way that we would have withheld the money if they didn't pass the laws. So there, there's stuff happening on national and state levels. The problem is, is that, again, there's this public perception that if you have HIV, you deserve it, or, you know, you, it was your own fault. And as a result, there's this willingness to be punitive. And the other thing I think that feeds into this is when we talk about the AIDS epidemic, we talk about Africa because it's comfortable to talk about Africans suffering, but it is not comfortable to talk about the epidemic in terms of Americans. Um, you know, the president was talking about the lack of access to antiretrovirals today in Africa, and it wasn't until the end of his speech that he mentioned that there are 6,700 Americans waiting for access to these drugs that can save their lives. That's a really horrendous statement about America.